Yeah. I think I've, it's, it's maybe a little bit of a, um, a throwaway comment, but I feel like I've probably learned more <laughs> in the last five years than maybe the last 25 in that sense of just, just oh, yeah. sort of this, this idea of sen- and sense of, I thought, you know, I thought so much of sport and I still do, but it, it, it's, it's a narrow lens to view the world in that sense. Yeah. And then you get out into the big bad one. I thought, I thought, I thought I worked hard. Um, there's a lot of people grafting on the train to London, not now, but previously. Uh, yeah. And there's some people at the ragged end of fatigue, mental, physical, social. And yeah, yeah that's a different level of performance that, and also running a business. Oh God, all these things that I just never saw. Oh yeah, no, and you know, um, you hats off to all to you and all the entrepreneurs out there um, that try out new things that allow them to, you know, basically pay the bills um, and pursue their passions. And to it's it's um it's hard. It's really hard. You don't learn a lot of it. I think even in business schools, when they're teaching people to be entrepreneurial, they're teaching about scaling and market size and. They're teaching about, you know, the structure of an organization and hires and fires and human resourcing and finance. But just the, you know, your brain going all the time on how do I do this and do I not do this? And um, was that a bad decision? And how do I recover from this? And there's a new opportunity, you know, that yeah. it's a whole different type of buzz, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's exactly that. But also the heat of it, of, well, no one's going to do this for me. You know, just that sense of I'm ill oh, today. Yeah. Nothing's yeah. going to get, is, is anything going to get done or is it not? You know, you can't phone in sick or the sense of, um, of, of just, well, I, I've, I'm worried, but I'm the person who can resolve this. I'm the person yeah. who can move to action. And uh, I feel yeah. the threats where that sort of long, that long distance, well, I call it long distance when you're working with an athlete of like, this is my advice, you know, you know, take it or yeah. leave it. What do you think? You know, you take on the responsibility. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. another step to, to what a coach feels of, I'm going to have to answer for these results. Um, <laughs> the same way that a business owner has to feed the, feed the kids. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a different world and it gives you a whole new appreciation for, you know, while you were honing your craft, you know, with, with Olympians, you know, other people are honing their craft and, you know, from surgical theaters and, and business, you know, there are people that are very good at, taking ideas and developing a product and moving that product to market and shape, putting a business around it. And they're very, very good at it. And, you know, um, those kind of people don't tend to gravitate to, um, uh, uh, Olympic committees, you know, so <laughs> that the, it's a different type of person, isn't it? Um, the people that have the real savvy to be, um, you know, amazing CEOs and in brilliant, you know, a guy like Elon Musk would never apply to work at the Australian Institute of Sport ever in any <laughs> capacity, probably even as an intern. He probably just wouldn't go hang out with us. Um, yet at the same time, those minds are amazing. You know, yeah, um, these real entrepreneurial, creative minds are just amazing. But even something as subtle as. Kind of, we, we're kind of getting into it now, and I hope that we can just sort of drift drift into this discussion. But, yeah. Um, something as subtle as a dirty word that I would associate with the work that uh, in an institute that's uh, that's funded uh, is selling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that you know we might call it say communicating technical concepts or or um, explaining tricky scientific terms. Um, but ultimately, you're trying to get an idea across the line, um, mm. which when you think about, I remember, I remember suggesting this back at back probably 10 years ago now, we should do something on the science of sales. And it didn't go down well. <laughs> oh, I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. And I think it's so much needed. And um, you've heard... You know, you've heard a lot of really good, you know, Scott Drawer and, you know, yeah. Peter Keane and, you, you know, I mean, you, 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 even, even Ron Mon, even, you know, there's, a, there's a, a personality and, and a, an element of coercion and marketing and convincing, whether it's done with data or with the, the framing of the idea or how they um, set the stage for you to, you know, walk in and buy in. Um, 
Yeah, so, I mean, you know, Oscar Yukendrup, you know, there's some, there's some brilliant the, the people that have really um, knowledgeable individuals that really have honed the craft of, of almost genuinely enthusiastically selling their ideas and they do it so well. And, and, and it's so, so consistently, important. so, so yeah. consistent that you, you think, I've heard this lecture, I've heard this exact lecture from Ron Morton, but mm. I'm, I'm enjoying him explaining uh, yeah. The same concepts in the same way, yeah. That that's it's an yeah. interesting one, and that that sense of, oh, I've got to explain this idea again. But for you, it might be the first time, so I've got a responsibility for it to feel yeah. spontaneous and fresh and uh, and new. But that's such yeah. an important concept in in so many different fields. We're probably we're probably relatively mm -hmm. um, high on the skill scale for that as an applied scientist, you have to yeah. do that. You can't just, well, I'm just going to give you the hardcore version of this and that and yeah. hand off. I, I think, yeah, you, you, um, you, after about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 athletes, um, you see their eyes lose contact with you and then you see them turn and walk away. <laughs> and you're like, that didn't work, you know? And, um, <laughs> All those presentations you think early, early on where, you know, we were forced at the Institute of Sport, the athletes would all come in, the testing was done, we'd make up our little reports, we'd print them off, you hand them out, you know, and it, it became a running joke, didn't it, that at the end when you're packing up to leave, you'd see, you know, there's handouts sitting on tables and some in the, in the rubbish bin and you're just like, what did I do, you know, what, what, what were we doing, did they they basically sat there for 30 minutes and um, we filled an hour and we ticked a box. But I'm not sure if we truly enhanced some young talent's capabilities to pursue their dreams. Mm, yeah. Now, um, now I, I mentioned to you over the emails, I wanted to ask you about this. Yeah. So this was 2001. I think it was in Wales, uh, a UK sport conference. Uh, you were alongside Vern Gambetta, I think. Um, wonderful Vern. It yeah. could have been Celtic Manor, but I can't be sure. Um, it was one of our first sort of, yeah. okay, we, we've got funding. We can bring in speakers kind of idea. And, um, and you came over uh, brilliantly. And, and I remember thinking, okay, there's going to be some demonstrations or this is going to be a stand-up lecture. And I think you did give a lecture. It was about the combination of hypoxic training and heat training i think and there was a new zealand yeah, study yeah. in there and that's that was that that was good yep great great stuff and you know we we were full of respect for for you guys as as uh, forerunners for the institute systems um and they were talking we, we were going oh they're, they're doing like ice vests and hyperhydration and we were like we've got some serious groundwork before we start getting into that stuff and you came over and you gave this lecture and i, and I was genuinely moved by it um it was one of those profound moments. I'll never forget it. And the title of the lecture, Jane Goodall, an analogy. And I was like, hmm, okay, we'll go and have a listen. I've done a little bit of reading in evolutionary biology, psychology, and so on, uh, just out of curiosity. Um, but it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a, I don't know if you've got a recording of it, but you should put it out there somewhere if you, if you have. Yeah, um, I should revisit that. Yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't about chimpanzees fishing for termites or oh, they're the, they they're quite good at tool making. It was about that about how she integrated into into the chimpanzee family and social network. Can you twenty years ago? So I, I you know I, yeah, I don't yeah. want to I don't want to set you up here. <laughs> I'll get got lost, get my slides out. But can you can you remember that that session? Yeah, I do. I, I do remember and I also remember being quite nervous um, because I had been speaking with Peter Keane about um, what you can talk about and what you can't talk about. And you gotta get permission. Um, it back in, in two thousand you know one you um, you know, Sydney had come and passed and Australia was riding high, but everybody knew that the, the UK was on the march, like you guys were on the march. I remember the 96 Olympic Games, um, you know, not, not so much. And we would have visitors from the UK and there was no money. I think Peter came by on a, yeah. on a visit and, you know, you'd, you'd try to and shout him a drink and pay for a meal and try to help him out. And it was no, it was no threat. It was, 
it was just, you know, um, kind of a youthful, a ambitious um, exploration. But by 2001, you guys, people knew there was funding, things were starting to happen in the UK. So we had, they had to talk about, well, what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, one of the areas we'd been doing research was in thermoregulation and in altitude and, and the potential intersection between the two um, was provocative and it, it wasn't mm -hmm. giving anything away. Um, and it just kind of was an example of stuff we'd done to showcase it, but also the future of where it could go. So that was like, okay, take, you can talk about that. And then the other one was, um, some of it was gonna be aerodynamics and oh, you can't talk about aerodynamics and cycling, that's a secret weapon, you know, you gotta be careful there. You can't oh. talk about the bike. You had, you had to take permission from the Australian Olympic Committee yes. or set up. Yes. Uh, I see, I see, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, because they don't want, you know, staff just willy nilly running around and, you know, giving out trade secrets, you know. Um, and the other thing that people are worried about, as you probably know, when people are going to conference is, they're, they start to get worried when certain countries get enough money um, and they get organized. They're starting to worry about talent shifts as well, that people yeah. get stolen, you know. Um, why is Nike and, um, you know, Under Armour and Adidas, why are they all in Portland, Oregon? You know, why is Facebook and Google and Apple mm -hmm. all in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley? The, the talent moves around. So anyway, the, it's a long wind up to say that the Jane Goodall talk, they're like, you're going to talk about what? Yeah, sure. Go for it. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was like, you can see, I have no idea what that topic is. You can go for it. And for me, the topic was interesting because, um, you know, as um, all of us that have come through, you know, an academic training line, what happens is you um, you have peers and they go into to academia and they're teaching and lecturing and they're doing research. And when when we do our work in sports science, I felt like it was scoffed at. It was like um, almost laughed at. It was like, oh, you've got to be kidding. You know, you're 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 putting ice vests on people to decrease their core temperature prior to exercise in a hot event like like Atlanta and you're looking at whether it will eke out a half a percent or one percent performance gain. It just seemed for people in diabetes or people in cancer, people that were doing real research that we were just being frivolous. Um, and I was thinking that um, really it, in so many different areas of, of research, um, there's just different types of research. And I remember hearing um, a lecture as a graduate student and I remember um, listening to this idea that research is either well done or not well done. It's just good research. It's just good experimental design. It's a good question. It's well framed, nice hypothesis. It's good research and there's bad research. It's like, you're lazy, you're sloppy, you're not calibrated. It's just, it's not a good experimental design. You haven't asked a good question. You don't have, a, you haven't controlled anything. Um, and then the kicker is research is either research findings are relevant or they are not relevant. And I thought that was really interesting. So you, at one time in your life, may not be very interested in how bees navigate when they fly. That's totally acceptable. You're not interested in bees and you're not interested in flight. But you may later as an engineer get a job with NASA and be working uh, up some uh, drones that can fly and navigate on their own. And all of a sudden that research becomes highly, highly, highly relevant to you and interesting. And so the Jane Goodall analogy was about saying, like, just look at it from a different angle. A lot of people love Jane Goodall. You know, she had profound impact on how we understand primates and how we understand, you know, ecology and how we understand evolution and how we understand what is man, what is not man. Like, you know, it's hard to find somebody who goes, oh, Jane Goodall, ah, what a... She, she, she should up her game. She's no good yeah. at what she does. If there's any criticisms of her work, it's sort of like, oh, well, don't give them names. Don't give the chimps names. It's yes. sort of, it's quite superficial in that sense of just, oh, exactly. we, 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 we don't like the tone of it. We're just going to take a little pot shot at it in a tweet kind of way. <laughs> no, and so I, when I remember reading through, um, Jane Goodall does a number of lectures. My, my wife actually got to listen to Jane Goodall speak and, um, and she's an amazing woman and there's a lot written about her. And I was kind of, um, my, my undergraduate is in zoology and, um, and it's a zoology physiology degree. So we did a little, lot of, you know, um, animal studies. And 
I started to think, you know, the things that made Jane Goodall great are probably what make a sports scientist great. And some of those themes that that jumped out was she had a real early interest. Very early on, she was interested in in chimpanzees. And there was actually a picture of her as like a two or three year old with a stuffed animal. And that stuffed animal was a, was, was a little doll. It was like a, a, a monkey doll and she held it. So, and you, you know, how it is a lot of sports scientists have this mad keen interest in sport from a very early age. They're, they love sport. They love the environment of sport. They, they love the game of sport. The other thing that I thought was amazing is she, you know, she went to Oxford. Like she's a legitimate hardcore, well-trained scientist at Oxford. You know, it's not, not no, <laughs> no disrespect there. And there are a number of great sports scientists that have done very well. They've got, they've got come through good schools. They've had, you know, they've taken hard courses. Some of them could have gone medicine. They could have gone physical therapy or physiotherapy. They could have gone, you know, biochemistry. They decided to go into sport. It wasn't the only option. It was what they decided to. I thought that was really interesting. Um, I remember one of the other things, um, she worked with Leakey, um, mm -hmm. who, you know, was a profound mentor. And I felt like um, a lot of great sports scientists I was meeting had someone that kind of nurtured them and supported them and guided them. And I thought that was, that was actually a really important element um, as well. And then you mentioned, you know, just kind of taking classic experimental protocol and saying, I'm not going to be trapped by that. I don't have to do a... 20 subject, you know, Latin square, test, retest, experimental design, repeated majors de Nova, Bonferroni post hoc. Like, you don't, it doesn't have to be that, that structured. And she was going into the wild and she was learning all kinds of things, but it took her a long time to assimilate into this kind of, into the jungle. And after spending, you know, like um, by 2001, when I went over there, I'd spent, um, Let's see, I came over in 96. So I had four years in the jungle with the cyclist, you know? Yeah. And um, and I just thought that was such a fitting analogy that if you really want to, I'd been testing everyone in the lab. I wasn't really out in the field with them. And when you get out in the field, you're like, oh, whoa, you know? Yeah. They don't give a stuff about those training zones I put together. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. Those cadence reps are falling off, you know? I, it started to, you started to see other priorities emerge. And things I thought a priority start to diminish. Um, and the other thing, too, is just the element of trust. And, you know, Jane Goodall got assimilated into this community of, of primates and they accepted her so she could have just profound insights on how to translate knowledge into action. And I thought that was like one of the real brilliant moves was um, when sports scientists could be integrated into the teams I th people say, well, how do they make a difference? And I said, they make a difference. One, because if they learn something, which they can, because their brains are trained to learn, they can learn classic findings, but they can find the right timing and they have the uh, element of trust to translate the information into action. And if you're not in with the group, it doesn't even matter if you're right, you're probably wrong. So yeah, so, yeah, so all those themes came together and the analogy kind of just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. Um, and I thought uh, I would try it out. I actually tried it out with you guys a bit before. I tried it out in one graduate seminar with some students coming in, but really tried it out with you um, as a, as a, I figured if it, <laughs> it was terrible over there in Wales, I'd be able to get home without anyone knowing. Yeah. Yeah. And you can go back and say, look, you know, those permissions. I just, I just ruined this chimpanzee lecture. It was amazing. It was a real red herring for them, but it wasn't. And, and that sense of, there's so many uh, points that you're able to make, but, but that, that sense of trust is something that mm. I, I can, I can remember that session of right, right. Okay. This is something that we should be working with because up until that point, working with Olympians, it was, it was it was unspoken about whether you were integrated. We recognized that that integration was an important thing or that you needed to, I suppose the, the, the basic version was you just need to tell them better what to do as opposed to you work with them, you get to know them, you understand them, you ask them questions, and then you might be in a position for them to seek your advice. It's not until that point that there's a tipping point of, okay, well, you haven't been annoying for the last five years. 
what do you think? That's the sort of moment where it just yes. transfers and, until that point or sitting on the side, listening and learning about the chimps from the sort of the, the, the outside of the camp and then spotting the opportunity to make friends, spotting somebody who's the leader or who the influencer. It's such a powerful, powerful um, uh, there was one part I remember I, I left out. Um, I actually had in the slides, I had a section um, and just for time, I didn't do it. And I didn't want to reveal um, some of the problems I had um, been facing or the challenges I'd been facing. I didn't want to reveal any coaches' names or athletes. So there was a section I left out. But now that it's so long ago, it doesn't matter. Um, and it was a section of how Jane um, was really curious about the young uh, monkeys and they were really curious about her. Um, and so, uh, but she got too close uh, to these, to the, to the, the young uh, chimpanzees and it disrupted the whole, the whole ecosystem and social dynamics within the, the troop, this, this um, group of monkeys because the mothers, you know, are very protective. And even though you're accepted and you can be around us, I'm not gonna let you hang out with my baby um, type of a thing. And the analogy was, um, I had a couple situations where early on um, the athletes were saying, hey, Dave, you know, come, I wanna run through this power meter data with me. I wanna, I wanna know what you think, you know, have you seen what coach has put together for this next week? And do you think that's right for me? And I remember one female cyclist um, who, was kind of getting overtaken. There were some young cyclists that were coming up and starting to nip at her heels and they were about to take over her spot. And so this older cyclist was really being super nice to me. Wow, it's great having you on board. You're, the new insights, it's been great having you travel with the team and you know we're getting ready for world championships and I haven't been great these last couple races. You're looking at my data. What do you think I should do? And so, and I was early on, I'm like, oh, someone's listening. This is great, yeah. you know, and she was a very charismatic cyclist and um, very successful. And so I was saying, well, let's sit down. Let's have a little meeting. We'll have a cup of coffee. I'll go, I'll go over with you. I got the laptop off, the classic sports science picture, you know, the, the sports yeah. scientist Pointing. and the athlete having it. Head, to, head tilted. Curious. Yeah. yeah, yeah, nice. Pointing, pointing at the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Yeah. And, um, and so... I told her that a couple options that were available to her and one she really liked. And one was that, look, maybe the volume isn't really working well for you right now. Maybe stay with the intensity, lighten up the volume. And we it's essentially like starting a taper early and it allows you to, to freshen up. And also you're starting to question the volume and you feel fatigued on the volume. And that's not a great headspace to be in when you're going into world championships. So um, she was all in. She goes, oh, my God, that's so smart. And it's all database. And I love this. And she was a statistician herself. And she's like, this is great. And it all sounds like a good story. But, you know, yeah, it's I know going. I was coming. Like, I was yeah, coming. <laughs> the, the, I mean, the coach was a good friend of mine. Like he lived at my house for a while. We had a period of time. And oh, my Lord, it just went so bad. It, things were tense in a variety of areas. But when he found out, I had told one of his top cyclists that, she didn't need to do the long training rides. She could just do the intervals. And he was like, hey, so, you know, Dave, when do you, when do you want to start coaching this team? You know, like, I didn't know you're going to start so early. You just let me know. You know, I'm happy to leave <laughs> if you want to start coaching this, if you want to be totally in charge. And, oh, my God, I had the silent treatment for, you know, for weeks, you know, and, and we barely recovered. And I was like, just like Jane, I had to overstep the kind of social structure and what, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And when you don't understand those nuances, even though you got great knowledge, you can just give it out at completely the wrong time, at completely the wrong way and do way more harm than good. Yeah, I, I thought you were going to originally say that when, when you, you the, the young chimps were more engaged and interested, there's a sort of a receptivity bit where actually maybe you can't influence the older chimps athlete, athletes. We shouldn't use it too much interchangeably, should we? But um, yeah. but. It's difficult to influence the the people with a with a routine and a plan, and and so engaging with younger athletes. That's what I thought you might have have done, but it's easy to it's, get carried away in that sense, isn't it? It it is, and um, I do think, like in um, in the NBA, um, the older, more established guys, you know, they're getting paid ten, twenty million dollars a year, and it's a business, and. People are very, very protective and very careful about 
who comes in and who doesn't and realize that, you know, who knows, 80, 90% of the stuff coming in to sell you something is snake oil salesman. Yeah. It is a pump and dump and it's looking to promote someone's reputation or to, um, you know, pr promote a concept that this person is, you know, evangelical about. And there is no commitment. They're not going to stay with the program. They're just in for the cash and out. So, so the seniors are protected, very protected. Um, and they don't let you in and they don't want you in. And even if you do get in, they're not going to really listen because it just it's better to have nothing than crazy. But you're right. The the um, the the rookies, the people coming out of university, they haven't formed their crew yet. And there is this interesting cycle in the NBA of, like, say, a young Michael Jordan coming in the NBA. He doesn't have anyone around him. And then there's a group within the team that builds up with him. And as he becomes confident and extraordinary his support staff become confident and extraordinary with them. Mm -hmm. And so you see these little pods that kind of lock and load and, and, and kind of click into the athlete and grow with the athlete. And I felt like that. I felt like that with Anna Mears. I felt like that with, um, you know, Cadell Evans. You know, when I first met him, he had no entourage. He had no group. He had no advisory board. You know, he was just a young 17-year-old mountain biker. And then what happened is a group of us kind of formed around him. Um, and I think it, for that reason, when you go to a senior athlete, sometimes they already have established relationships in history. The younger athletes are easier to engage with and connect with because they're looking to form, you know, that support group. Mm. Yeah. But, and, and equally, like you say, when you sort of, when you start growing with them and the momentum starts to gather the banter at training camps, the that's that spark and spontaneity of thinking this is great you know we this is this has got momentum now and that that moment of pulling back and saying mm, not sure um i remember being asked i, I sat in the stands at in penrith uh at the rowing and um one of the coaches said to me so i've been on the team two years um one of the coaches said to me do you think we should change the warm-up tomorrow and that was my thought, oh, wow, she, this is a chance for me to change. I've been, we've been talking about warm-up for ages, and uh, this is a chance to influence a coach that's been really resistant. I said, I don't think tomorrow's the good day to change the warm-up. <laughs> I'm just pulling back. And, <laughs> and I think I dodged a bullet there of just going, oh, yeah, we should meddle, meddle around with it. And here's some wisdom that you could use and uh, see how that goes in an Olympic final. Um, and, and that's just noise, isn't it, from a, for a coach of just thinking, I, I'm worried, I'm concerned, I'm reaching out to, to others who might be able to hopefully give me some confidence or unlock something searching that, that uh, creates that sort of connection. I, I have um, spoken a couple times now about this, um, this theme of, of when your um, belief systems completely clash with the athlete's belief systems or the coach's belief systems and how... Um, you have one of these contingency tables where you have no belief in an intervention or you have a lot of belief in it as a practitioner. And usually we're guided by, you know, a, a, a powerful mentor or a, um, a, you know, a professor that's done years and years of study or some data sets that we've collected ourselves and how they connect with other data sets for a variety of reasons. We're like, I really believe this would help you. I really believe this is the right time and that this would work. And there's other things we're just like, I just don't believe it. I do not believe it at all. I would never advise it. And if you're using it, I would probably tell you to quit. I just don't get it. Um, and then you mix that with the athlete and the athlete has, they also don't believe in stuff, tons of stuff. They just don't believe in. And they've got their own kind of BS filter. They know that that's, that's probably doesn't work, does it? But then they have things they profoundly believe in. And sometimes it's just ritual, you know, like the American baseball players that need to wear the certain color socks or they need to have the certain batting glove. And if they don't have it, oh, you know, it's the world's going to fall apart. You know, um, I've seen NBA basketball players with shooting sleeves, you know, not the white shooting sleeve, the blue shooting sleeve. Where is it? You know, you're like, it probably doesn't matter, but to them it does. So then within those four cells, you start to ask these questions. I believe this is good for you to do. This altitude camp would be good for you. The cyclist says, I believe in altitude too. I can't wait to get up there. This will be great. Let's go. If I don't believe in something, they go, there's this wristlet, wrist bracelet. It has a hologram in it. 
and it's supposed to make my balance better. I, I don't believe it. And then I say, I don't believe it either. They go, great, I'm not gonna use it. Mm-hmm. That, those are no brainers. But the other two, the other two quadrants, those are tricky, where the scientist believes passionately and the athlete doesn't believe at all. And in those cases, I see a lot of young sports scientists, um, and I did it probably myself, you can be irritating. Yes. Guys, listen. Hey, guys, let me show you some facts. Hey, guys, I'll show you some data. Hey, there's another study. I told you guys. I told you, know, and you can just be downright irritating. Um, and on the other hand, there's athletes that believe in stuff and the scientist doesn't believe in it. And in those cases, the coaches and the uh, athletes will sometimes want the scientists to just disappear. They're like, we don't need smarty pants coming in and telling us what we do doesn't work because it does work. I set a world record doing that. I'm going to do the same thing again. And the scientist is saying, I'm not, you know, saying you didn't win a world record. We all saw that. I'm saying that that particular warm up didn't help at all. And there's another one you could do that I think would be better. You could have set the world record by more, you know, Mm. and those are tricky conversations. And I think in both, you're waiting for moments of doubt. You're waiting for, for the athlete to struggle. And when the athletes struggle, they're susceptible. When they're injured, when they're sick, when they're performing poorly, that's when they're susceptible. And that's usually when the snake oil salesmen come in and they try to sell. But I think the legitimate embedded, you know, sports scientists, they, that's, that's, you got to jump on those opportunities. You got to say, this is the time there is doubt in that, that athlete's brain. This is the time for me to be close, to be consistent and to try to, you know, get, get my message through. I think Mm. that's when a lot of behavior change happens. Yeah, and, and there's probably a level of um, maybe too many axes for this one, but but I don't, I'm not sure whether it's sensitivity in terms of the topic, possibly proximity to competition. Um, mm. So, so look, you want to try this new funky drill jogging stuff going on? It's October. That's cool. Let's try it. You've got two weeks. Um, or post games, right? Let's open up the innovation tin that we were all those. All those little ideas that we were saying, ah, no, hang on, wait for after. We can explore again. But the I remember, um, I can't remember what ACSM it was now. I was presenting some warm-up data, uh, some priming, oxygen uptake, kinetics data. Uh, 1% improvement in 800 meters by doing some a particular priming exercise 20 to 30 minutes before. Um, and uh, our good friend David Pine was there. And uh, he says... <laughs> Hang on a minute. I've heard you secret squirrels don't want to th- any competitive advantage. Why are you sharing this performance data? I said, you go and have the conversation with the coach. That's bef- what that's designed specifically to work just before the Olympics. Um, go and have a conversation with the coach and the athlete. Can I go and mess around with your warm up? A bit like the coach asking me, you know, or let's oh, change that. It took me nearly 10 years to get that project off the ground. Of, I think there's some capacity. I think there's some potential for this. And then I saw David a few years later <clears throat> um, with his wife, uh, Naroa. And, uh, and I said, how's that going? And he said, yeah, yeah, we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. I think um, you've probably in your time had conversations that connect you with the uh, military or special forces mm. or, you know, special for like DARPA or all of the, 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 these are interesting institutions and they're exciting initially. Um, but to connect in a meaningful way with defense, Australian defense, US defense, you know, UK defense, you know, SAS, the, it sounds exciting. Um, but they are their own, you know, unique complexities rolling around in their organization. And then sport has its own unique complexities. And when the partnerships happen and they work, there's usually a lot of groundwork. And I've had the same thing. People go, I can't believe you gave that away. I'm like, you want to go work with the Navy SEALs and the Australian SAS and, and two commander regiment? Go do it. Um, have, I will tell you who to call. You know, yeah. <laughs> go, go give it a go, go try it. It's hard. It's really hard to, to get a, a rhythm and to get all the elements kind of coordinated and moving at, at the same rhythm. It, it's tricky. And so you're right. It's it's kind of like the chef, isn't it? They talk about it all the time. Like, I'm going to I'm going to tell you what to buy and I'm going to tell you how to put it together. And uh, and you cook it and you're like, it doesn't taste like in the restaurant. And it's because you're not a master chef. You're just 
you're just reading the recipe book and it yeah. doesn't have the same it doesn't have the same taste <laughs> did you just a tangent back to a comment you made there about zoology um zoology and physiology but um, I'm curious to know whether you lent on your zoology training, because I think sometimes, certainly in elite sport, when actually there's um, there's no reference point. There's no. I remember putting heptathlon into PubMed, and it just came back nothing. It actually laughed at back at me, um, and that sense of we we don't have um, other than the, the measurements that we're taking uh, with the athletes, we don't have a guiding light here, a road roadmap. And so what I'm going into these conversations with athletes and coaches about are super fundamental first principles. <laughs> what, what relates to the physiological demands or the, the event demands? How do you adapt those things? How does that turn up on the day? That's, that's sort of my, my six word sports science degree. What determines performance, ad adapt it, turn up on, and perform? Um, but so I'm linking back to the question in terms of the, you know, sort of deep biology and, and fundamental um, science in that sense. Did you draw upon that a lot through your career? I thought the part that helped me most, the, the courses that I thought were really um, illuminating um, that seem esoteric, but to me were really a great perspective were the courses in um, ecology. Um, I, th I thought that ecological systems um, that my action has a, uh, a reaction and that it is a web of interactions around the elite athlete. And any one of those kind of nodes can have a powerful influence on, on other areas. And so um, I get what you're saying that, you know, when we, we have we have N equals one scenarios coming our ways in these Olympic athlete preparation scenarios that have, that have maybe never happened ever, ever, ever. When I, when I went into the NBA, I started working with a seven footer from Cameroon who had broken his navicular twice. PubMed that one. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think there's less than 4,007 footers in the world, you know, and of those only a small part are playing basketball and of those, you know, how many have broken their navicular and I mean, and I'm not a navicular specialist. And so you find yourself trying to come in and say, um, how fast do we drive? And, and I feel like when you know what you're doing, you drive kind of fast. And when you don't know what you're doing, it's kind of like, it's, it's like a dark, wet road. And you're trying to decide how fast should I drive this? I know it, there's danger everywhere. And maybe the road's straight for a while and I could go faster, but I can't see. So I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna be a little more cautious. Um, and I think that what um, I learned from the, um, you know, zoology and ecology kind of training was one, you're in this ecosystem. And two, when you go into an area that you don't know, um, it's okay to go slow and, it's, and, and be super aware that everything's connected. It's not just you working with an athlete, everything, you know, is connected. There's a concept um, that I, I used uh, in, a, in a presentation back at the Australian Institute of Sport. One concept in um, ecology is this idea of, of apex predators. Um, and apex predators are, um, they sit on top of the food chain, like, like sharks or like wolves um, or like tigers. And what's happening is the apex polar bears, um, they're becoming extinct. And as they become extinct, the ecosystem, it falls apart. There's, there's mass extinction underneath. The apex predators um, help put a, a harmony into the, the uh, ecosystem that allows for the maintenance of, of high biological diversity and, and, and a lot of health um, in, the, in the system. And so what I did, which was probably a little bit of a, a gutsy move, or I, um, uh, is probably not even gutsy, it was probably a bit cocky. I was saying that in a lot of sport, uh, I think they, the uh, sports scientists, good sports scientists, are the apex predator. I think they are like a pack of wolves. And I think that they contribute to the health of the ecosystem. They, they kill bad ideas and they, um, they have surveillance over all of, of the, the, you know, the animals. They can see what's struggling and what's not. 
they don't get too big. You know, the pack of wolves doesn't get too big. The pack of wolves has an alpha male, which kind of like guides the culture of the sports science community. And it, there's a really cool story. If you ever want to see a great video, you can YouTube it. There's a video about um, the wolves in Yellowstone. And it's a really nice, um, David Attenborough does the, the soundtrack for it. And it talks about how profound um, the reintroduction of the wolves were to the health of the ecosystem in West Yellowstone's National Park. And a lot of people have told me like, so what if there's no sports scientist, you know? I'm like, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You'll be like a barren wasteland. It'll just be like a bunch of sick maize, you know, elk and there, there, there'll be erosion and there will be, there will be, and you won't even know it because that's just what it is and you're fine, but it won't be extraordinary. It won't be innovative. It won't build something for the future. It's not going to be anything they do a documentary movie about. It's, it's going to be flat. It's going to be flat and ordinary. And with the introduction of the um, sports scientists, you have a chance for it to be extraordinary. Um, so I, I pulled that, you know, longer answer to the question, but I feel like an understanding of ecosystems is really helpful for people that decide to go out and understand how to work in elite sport, not just in their sport, but, you know, you were part of not just the sports you worked with, but you're part of you were part of the larger ecosystem and think of all the growth and all the mentorship and all the students you worked with and how it's all grown in the UK over the last 20 years. It's extraordinary. Mm, I'm just, um, I'll pick up, <laughs> I'm just wondering how that went down. Uh, did you present to coaches? <laughs> I presented to a larger group of uh, uh, the sports science community. So I was trying to give them a rally call to say, okay. be, be proud, don't be weak. Yeah. I would say like, if the wolves, like there, there are bears as well. I see coaches as like bears, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it's really funny because the rivers end up being influenced by the wolves because the wolves hit, hit one part of the ecosystem, but it goes all the way down to, to mice and other small animals and the vegetation by the side of the banks and how the rivers flow and healthy rivers versus sick rivers. So in the analogy I was using, the river is like the athlete and it can be slow and lazy and meandering and sickly, or it can be clean and oxygenated and vibrant and, and alive. Um, that was kind of where the rivers are. The coaches are like you need you need the co you need the coaches without a doubt they're super super important they're they're like the like I was saying like the bears you know, but the bears can't do it alone. It, it's an ordinary environment without the pack of wolves. Yeah, okay. I can imagine that it the, was a reach. It was a reach. Yeah, no. I like, well, I like that. I like yeah. that. I could, when when you said uh, sports scientists are like apex predators, I, I was probably immediately oh careful, careful. We, coaches that are tuned in might hear that and think, oh, that's just sports scientists getting ahead of themselves. But what you're talking about is the role that they play, not in at, I'm at the top, I command this system. It is it is the role that they play in in the utility to the environment specifically that that can uh, enrich. If I'm taking that correctly. It's kind of like, um, you know, when, um, when a pack of wolves are around, elk and deer and rabbits um, and beaver and everything behaves differently. It behaves with a certain respect that this is a no-go zone and this is a go zone. It, it tightens up the niche partitioning on where animals live and what they eat and what they do. And without the wolves, it all gets lazy and things, people just start, it's like having strength coaches pretend like they're dietitians, you know, and having assistant coaches pretend like they're psychologists. And it's just, everything can kind of meander. It can kind of go wherever you want it to go. It doesn't matter. Um, mm. And I think one thing that the scientists can do is they're like, hey, we've got expertise here and it can even go deeper if required. And we've now got expertise here, which can go deeper. And it starts to have, um, you know, protocols and rhythm and routines. And we're at this time of the season and now we're working on these themes and now we're trying to make sure people don't get injured. And it just, it kind of tightens it up a little bit. I feel like scientists do that well. 
versus the kind of like, I just got a gut feel and we'll just roll with the punches and whatever. Yeah, there's an interesting couple of dynamics there. And I'd love to um, ask you a few questions about your time at the Australian Institute and, and the longevity that you had there too, in that you... Uh, we were moving through roles really quickly in the English system. Um, but um, there are a couple of lurches that we experienced um, that profoundly changed the way that we worked. Where probably when when I met you, first of all, in 2001, we were mimicking the Australian model. There was a lot of Aussies in the UK. And, um, and we were saying, well, that's successful. Um, let's copy it. And there was a little bit of resistance from the sense of uh, they're taking our jobs, you know, that sort of uh, defending the the, um, uh, the 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 status quo. Um, but but one of the one of the things that it it meant that we were doing was that we were in roles at an institute or an Olympic association delivering to a sport. So I'm, I'm employed by the Olympic Association. I I work for rowing. I work for bobsleigh. I'm assigned. When the Olympics were announced in 2005 for 2012, uh, 2006, it must have been 2006, and uh, by the, there was a new uh, budget announced for sport. So there was an injection of cash. And then <clears throat> UK sport, in their wisdom, uh, and it was certainly an uncomfortable time for, for us in the system, was they changed it around to say the sport buys the practitioner and so you you had you had a sense of just well i i don't like that person anymore so that was gone but there was also a sense of okay <clears throat> i don't understand biomechanics uh from a sport um and you know not many of us do um but at the same time there's the the performance gain that you can get from a good biomechanist is huge and so it then came down to a What's the pressure and the urgency that I'm experiencing? Right, my athletes are injured. A couple of physios, please. Uh, they fatigue a bit. Nutrition, please. And so there was a there was a marketplace where not only we had to upgrade our communication of what we had to offer and the performance gain. Um, and there's a there's a sort of a there's a there's probably the downside of that, which was you had to get in with the coach. There was. Your role depended on your the quality and friendship of your relationship. So, <clears throat> perhaps in some professional sports, people have fairly lucrative careers by just sustaining those relationships. Perhaps not making the impact. Um, so, what I'm hearing there um, is is the need for quality, quality in your work, and one of the things that that change introduce at the English Institute of Sport was that we became much better at team working, much better at communicating. And that, I'm sure there was huge competitive advantage to that. But it also meant that we lost probably that cleanliness in the discussion of, hang on a minute, let's just stop because this doesn't work. We had to pull some of those punches in that regard. Um, so am I, am I hearing that um, correctly in terms of the, the apex leak, linking to the need to be able to maintain and sustain quality in the processes? Yeah, and I think, you know, it, it's been fun. Like there's a lot of, it, there's like, you know, the, the UK story and the Australian story are both two really successful stories, both with home Olympic games and um, both with legacy, both with legacy individuals, as well as legacy research and work and, and also legacy learnings. I think, you know, both um, runs were, were amazingly um, positive and professional and po just, just successful. But they changed. They definitely changed. You know, in, in 96, um, at the AIS, we were very much come to the Institute of Sport. It's an amazing place with amazing people. It's going to kind of be free. It's government funded. You're, you've got a national team. You can access this group for free. So it was kind of like, you know, that's where the Test Method Manuals book came out of. It's that mm. Chris Gore and, um, and Rebecca put out. It, it was all about saying, what are the protocols? How do you, um, how do you identify um, within a group of elite athletes, the characteristics of the best athletes in the world, 
And then how do you identify those characteristics in you? And then how do we come up with some kind of frequency and testing to try to nurture you along the way with thoughtful, um, you know, interventions? So you need to be quicker if you want to win, or you need to have a higher aerobic capacity. And, and it led to all those TID studies, those talent identification studies as well as if you know the sport, mm -hmm. then you just go find them. And it was really a lot. It was, it was, it was lab based and project based. And then um, as we got this um, Olympic athlete funding in Australia, this OAP funding, they started funding um, projects where scientists could be more integrated into the group. Um, but in our model, that happened before the sports paid for it. It was like a it was like a pilot study, because after two thousand, it was the same move. the The sports had to pay for the service provider, and you got all this stuff like they're not going to pay for you if they don't like you. And so it's like, how are you going to be liked? And you started to see two divisions of sports scientists, people like um, you know Tony Rice and and me. Um, and, and others, we, we kind of gravitated into these sports science coordination roles. But then you saw people, you know, Shona and Luis um, Burke and David Pine, they kind of moved into um, these, uh, th these kind of um, concept uh, development pieces, exercise in immunology, exercise in recovery, exercise in altitude, exercise in nutrition. So they would kind of grow up um, kind of like an applied sports science division, whereas the, those of us that were moving into sport, we were saying, I'm going to build this team and I'm going to build this team. And I'm going to set this priority and I'm going to um, kind of organize our approach this way. So we we had grown up together. So the friendships were and the respect was high. And I think that really helped Australia. Um, but you could definitely see kind of the transition now. Um, and, and interestingly enough, Shona and I just published a, a little editorial. We called it. Um, uh, factories, movies, and sports science. And we talked about how we felt like early in the early days, we felt like we were working in a factory, like a gold medal winning factory, produce the winner. And you had your little division and in came the raw stuff and you did your testing, you made your report, you had your presentation and um, you might go out and supervise some training sessions. It was, it was like working in a factory. And we said at the Olympics made us feel like we were part of a movie. And it started to feel like we were in a special effects studio where we, you know, George Lucas is going to produce a Star Wars movie and he's coming to us and saying, I need these effects to be integrated in these ways. Can you do it on this timeline? And it had a, it definitely had a different um, feel to it. The problem or the challenge now, I think, is that when you go to um, let's make a movie, um, you forget about all the underpinning you know, science and scientific infrastructure and what's going to attract interns, what's going to attract good young sports scientists. And they're usually attracted to very credentialed mentors. And when all the mentors leave and all the, you know, the, 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 the smart advisors leave to different stuff, you start to get, you start to get young students wondering where do I want to go with my career and why would I work for the English Institute of Sport? Why would I work for why would I work for the Australian Institute of Sport? What's it gonna give me? What, I'm gonna go work my ass off for four to eight years and then what, you know? Like I can make a lot more money in pro sport. They'll triple. You go work with a Premier League soccer team, they pay you four times the amount of money, you know? And it's the same kind of work, why not? So I think you're asking some really good questions and both you and I, it's a we have an interesting lens, don't we? To see the kind of the 90s and the early 2000s and the run into an Olympic Games, but also the run out of an Olympic Games and, you know, probably one of the real take home messages is what do you have to build today not to help the athlete? Maybe the question is, what do you have to build today to attract the talent? What's going to make young sports scientists want to come and grow and build and be ambitious in your system? What are you going to have to do? Yeah, I can, I can certainly remember the moments after London in the sense of, I mean, you, you don't have to motivate people to to a home games. I'm sure you had that in the 90s towards 2000. Of just I, looking around and just thinking, we moved really quickly on a lot of those things. That's a plus. You know, we, we gave decision making to people who had the most information. They were able to get on with it. Um, but, you know, there was, there was a lack of legacy uh, in certain aspects 
quality, quality work, left, right and centre, of just we didn't take the time, nor did we have the capacity, or perhaps we had too many pressures elsewhere, of making sure that we did uh, went the extra mile in terms of doing an extra test, recording that, uh, keeping that for uh, a repository of information of which we can lean on for decades to come. Uh, it moved It moved fast. It was exciting. It was intoxicating. But, uh, okay, we should be doing a lot of that groundwork now after. Now we haven't got as much funding, for example. Um, yeah. And I can remember, <laughs> I remember seeing you at uh, Ron Morn's conference. I think it must have been 2013, possibly 2012. And... Um, we were in the middle of a change piece for the Australian the English Institute of Sport, and uh, yeah. and you were asking <clears throat> asking questions of Nigel Mitchell and Ez about uh, what do you do if you don't if they don't like you and these sorts of things but, you know and um, <laughs> we were having a chat afterwards and you said so you're changing after winning Oh, we're screwed <laughs> <laughs> I know I know well. And that whole question was, is, is perplexed all of us is, um, you know, once you finish a home Olympic games, um, you lose a lot of enthusiasm and you lose these real leaders, these, these, uh, you know, leaders that are, um, it's a natural leadership. They're like real leadership. It's like proven leadership. And a lot of those leads leave. And then what happens is you get, transplanted leadership or you get outside leadership it's not in-house grown leadership and um i remember hearing about a talent id project that the uh, sas in australia the australian sas special forces um tried to run where they tried to um identify really bright people kind of like a, a a u.s rotc program really right bright people that could become exceptional leaders and so they wanted them fit and they wanted them to have leadership skills and they were going to like move them right into like top level leadership roles and they're going to fast track them into special forces um, because it, that's how talented they were and so they they tried it out and i spoke to some of the the operators and i said how, how were these guys and they're like oh they could do a lot of they could do a lot of pull-ups and they could also do, you know, matrix calculus in their head, but it didn't work around the fire, you know, not yeah. in a Ford operating base outside of Afghanistan. Yeah, it didn't work. It didn't work because they didn't have the respect. And a lot of us respect each other because of what we had to do to get here. And so what's really hard in elite sport is to transplant the leadership then transplant leadership for programs. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. I, I walked into a program with the 76ers. There's some really, really credential experienced operators. And when you, you walk in and say, Hey, I've got some ideas and I want to do this. And I want to do that. Um, how you, you interact after success with a bunch of serious operators, how you move forward next. I think that's a super challenging time. You know, because new people have to come in, but how they come in for a way that's not massively disruptive and you just don't end up with five years of arguments. You know, how does how do you build energy into a system that already had tons of energy and was super successful? It's, it's a great challenge. Mm. I mean, I think the UK is doing a pretty good job, you know, like it'll be really interesting to see, you know, in the in the. Tokyo, what happens, that's just going to be wild for a variety of reasons. Yeah. But by Tokyo, you start to see, is the legacy still strong, you know? And in, in Australia, you know, you can see that there was the rise and then there's the afterglow, Athens, you know? I remember I was with the cyclists, six gold medals, you're hoping for two, six, you know? We had young Anna Mears and Ryan Bailey and world records, and you're just going, <laughs> damn, all the stuff we were hoping was going to work in Beijing is... It, this is awesome. Um, but by um, Beijing, you know, four years later, you can feel the writing was on the wall. And then by, you know, your home Olympic Games 2012, you could you could tell that it's time you need to refresh this up. You need to you need to rechannel your approach. And, and um, what are the observations that you've been able to make having gone um, through an Olympic system and seen those successes and the highs and lows? and gone into professional sports, what are the key differences that you've observed? 
I got a couple answers on that. And I just realized that just as we transitioned into that answer, that I didn't really answer your first question. Um, when you were talking mm-hmm. about 21 years, you know, in, in at the AIS. And there's uh, probably one take home message there. Oh, we yeah. were talking about how do you sustain relationships and keep it going? And I never really got to the point um, that I, I feel really lucky that my job changed kind of every four to six years. It was just a different job, you know. And I'm a sports scientist in a lab. I'm a sports scientist in the field. I'm a sports science coordinator. I'm a, a lead for innovation and research. You know, so the, the job kept changing. And I think, you know, at, at, you know, 18 years in the job, I'm setting up, you know, an integrated combat center. Um, at 20 years earlier, I'm working on the best lactate protocols to use to advise you know, time trialists on intervals. So, so it, it just changed. And I think if you want to stay, what what happens is I was lucky. I was in a system that allowed me to change. If they, if they trapped me or they wouldn't promote me or they wouldn't develop me, uh, I think it would have been 20 years with one coach. I probably would have, yeah, it would have, that would have been hard. So just to close Mm -hmm. out on that one, I think that was, that was a good question. And I think the answer for me was that um, my role was allowed to change. Um, Hmm. The difference in, um, it's another really good question is, uh, what's it like in an Olympic program and what's it like in a professional program? In a professional program, you start to to really smell and feel and see the business. It's a business. Professional sports is making money. It is entertainment and it's making money. And, and, and underpinning that is this uh, a- athletic um, pursuit of excellence. It's, it's certainly part of it, but it is, you just feel it. We're making money and we are putting on a show and those are huge, huge. So you look at marketing departments in the NBA, look at the, the media and marketing, they're, they're as big as the support staff. That's because it's a show. You're putting on a show um, for people to sit down on the weekend, have a beer and watch a show. They want to see something exciting. Um, so you really feel that. The other thing you um, you feel is there's a level of politics that a strength coach can make. They can make $200,000 a year US, a strength coach. Like nothing special strength coach, not a research strength coach, just a, a charismatic, connected, experienced strength coach. Um, uh, an athletic trainer can make $400,000 a year, you know? Can you imagine? I don't know what the professors at Oxford get paid. They're not making four hundred. dollars Maybe they are. I don't think they are. Um, and so the amount of money in this system that is going to be uh, granted and bestowed, bestowed upon individuals with relatively, look, unique individuals, take nothing away from them. But if you stack them up and said, like, let me see your credentials. How have you been trained? How far are you down the pathway? It doesn't, or, or it doesn't what's your out. What's the potential for you to create impact? They would say that they're, um, they're, they're survivors. They probably do create impact because mm. they are really good about, um, you know, uh, instilling a belief of fact and to be consistent and to be trusted. And, you know, again, every tribe is different. And within these tribes, the equipment manager and the strength coach and the athletic trainer and the physical therapist and the assistant coaches, again, this is a whole new ecosystem. You think, you know, you know, one ecosystem, you know, the, the, the great barrier reef, well, you definitely don't know the Amazon jungle. It's a whole different ecosystem and everything works a little bit differently. And so I think um, the best thing for me was to have enough years to just come in and, you know, those analogies of path design where you just let, if you're going to put some walking paths down in a park, do not put the walking paths down when you plant your grass and you put your park, just put in your park, leave the paths out, watch the natural flow of traffic, see where it gets beaten down, look at where things are naturally happening, and then try to reinforce those paths that are already there and are probably quite functional and see if you can, you know, clean up the erosion and stuff. And so I think you need to 
If, if you're coming in, I came in from outside of the sport. Even if you come in from inside the sport, every team is different. Every coach philosophy is different. And you need to come in and figure out what's the natural rhythm and flow that's going on. And then start start growing on top of that. Don't 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 take that as status quo. Start growing on, on top of that. Um, I think communication is always important. But you'll find in pro sport, you you have to let people really own their space because if someone else starts to get close to their space, it's an immediate threat. And where are you going to go? What's the next What's the next job for, say, a young data scientist in the NBA making over two hundred thousand dollars a year? What's their next job? They would maybe be a lecturer on eighty thousand dollars a year. So they want to keep that job so bad. So you need to be very respectful about each person's place. Um, and if you want to get projects done, um, you got to realize that everybody's busy all the time. There's 82 games, so it's busy, busy, busy. And uh, if you want to try to do anything kind of innovative, you got to be really crafty because you're going to have to be innovative on the side and then reinsert it at the right time without ruffling feathers, or you're gonna to have to um, try to be innovative from within, but then you're gonna to need to have your disciplined champions to move that forward. You, you can't do it on your own. Um, and, and trust, mm. trust is a big thing. I had one basketball player tell me, hey, what if I came into your office and I put a camera up in the corner? I told you I'm instrumenting your keyboard. I'm gonna have you work now with a heart rate monitor on. And um, I uh, basically am tracking all your word searches and Google searches, and it's going to go into a big engine because we want to help you do a better job. What would you tell me? And I said, I get it. I get it. He goes, you would probably tell me, leave me alone. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't good. I was hired to do a job. Back off and let me work, wouldn't you? And he goes, when you're telling me about chips and cameras and blood and this, dude, I'm here because I'm one of the best basketball players in the world, in the freaking world, okay? So I don't need to wear a whole bunch of stuff because all you're going to potentially do is stress me out or worse yet, devalue me. You're going to go tell people I'm not as good as they think I am. And that doesn't help me either. And I, I think, you know, that goes right yeah. back to how we started this, this uh, answer to the question. It's a business. Remember, it's a business. Oh God, there's so much in there. Um, I love that idea though. And, and um, one athlete uh, that I worked with just when I first started working with her, I said, how do you want to work? Uh, I'm relatively into my career. So I've got a bit, a little bit of confidence, but she said, please just don't tell me my VO2 max is crap because I know it is, but I can run under two minutes for 800 meters. So, so I'm like, okay, yeah. okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. As a, that, yeah. that sort of monitoring what comes with that is evaluation. What comes with that is critique. What comes with that is focusing on the negatives in that sense of if it wandered by and said, I noticed your, your uh, typing speed is amazing. Uh, fantastic. No wonder you're great, uh, great sports scientist. You'd go, ah, okay, maybe, maybe I need a little bit more of this person in my life of starting with the positives first. Um, I can, and I can see just, just how that's heightened by the professionalism of, of that, that they, they understand their worth in the market and where they sit in the pecking order, as opposed to perhaps Olympic sport, you know, you, you, you only rise up for that, those, the world championships or the Olympics. Very few of them are on, on cereal packets. Uh, there, there's only a very few of them, but, but equally for the NBA or the Premier League or the Champions League, they, they, they know their worth. <laughs> And I think a role for the sports scientists in the NBA and, and the, the strength coach and the trainer and the whole, the whole group, I think one of the, the roles is to connect these extraordinary individuals to authentic experts. Um, it, it's a, a really, really messy place with a lot of fringe dwellers that are trying to get in and sell orthotics or to do bizarre chiropractic care or to come in with all these allied, you know, uh, health approaches. And no one's policing the field. The coaches look the other way. And, you know, it's uh, a lot of times the team doctors are super busy. They're off working in the hospital. They only come in for the games. So who's going to kind of police the integrity of if you've got an injured athlete or a fatigued athlete or, 
you know, they're normal people. So they get, they get all kinds of problems. They might not be able to see very well. They might have post-concussive, you know, issues. So who do you go to that's like legitimate? And how do you connect in a way that's not, they're just not ripoff artists that are saying, I'll help you, but you got to pay me 10 grand, you know, because there's a whole industry that's kind of around the NFL um, and, you know, the NHL, the NBL, the NBA, and they have, it's a whole industry of being able to come in when someone's hurt, they're like ambulance chasers, or they're playing poorly or they're shooting poorly and come in and say, for big money, I will fix them. Yeah. And so the, the, in, the people with integrity on the inside can say, hey, this person's very good in tendons. Let's talk to them. This person's very good with concussions. Let's go talk to them. And so you can kind of chaperone um, the, the, the individual in need to true expertise. And I think that role is much, much needed within the NBA. And I don't think if it, it might be needed in Olympic sport, but I didn't feel it as much, you know, mm. I just didn't feel it as much. Maybe because the money's not there. You know, they're not going to pay, they're not going to pay 10 grand for a funky pair of orthotics that are laced with copper and give you more energy at the end of a marathon. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but also the, um, in the Premier League in football and so on, I think there's a sense of that growing increasingly where it's a case of, okay, you're paying th- paid this much, paid that much, and I don't get the attention I need because you're off working with other players. Okay, come and work for me. Um, it's just simpler uh, for people to operate on, an, on a one-to-one basis for one player or two. Um, and I suppose it's in, in their interest too. Um, I'm reminded of your... Probably the other thing too is to just realize... Um, if you're down at, at the pub and you're having a chat, you know, with, you know, a friend um, and you're working in Olympic sport, kind of like, um, you know, what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. Like, you know, some people know the professional courtesies um, in the NBA or in some of these big pro sports. There will be people listening on the train or listening and they can sell information. They can say, I overheard. I'm pretty sure it's someone that works with the NBA or they'll know who you are. And if they hear you in an airport or hear you on a plane or hear you having a chat about information that's juicy, it's a good story, um, they, they can run it. So the whole idea of, you know, really, really respecting um, the wants and wishes of the players um, and doing nothing that might leak out that would harm their reputation is super important because if they find out it was you, then you're done. You're not going to be working with them anymore. Mm, okay, that's interesting. And, and I think I can think of a, a number of people who, who went on to professional sports who used to be really active, proactive on social media, contributing to the discussion, and then you know, last tweet was 2010 or something like that, where you you don't want to be communicating any of this out there. And which is a real shame in the sense that they added value. They added, they added those field observations and case uh, observations and insights that fed back into the community, but it was frowned upon. And and, um, that's, that's really observable that. Now you can see it. I, I've definitely um, been very, very low on my, um, uh, you know, Twitter, you know, Instagram, anything. I just, I, I follow a lot of people, but I'm, you know, very, very light on any posts at all. With especially when I was with the NBA, just so that it doesn't, anything doesn't get misconstrued. Mm, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So. Um, it's quite, a, I suppose, a big question. But what's what's left for you? And I, there's there's a background to this question because I'm I'm still searching, and I've got a like one or two really big sort of career goals still left. Um, what's what's left for you still? Really interested. Um, I've always been interested in you know environments, and I put people and technology in that environment. Environments that. Um, are, super, are very, very conducive for ambitious people to do ambitious things. I've just always found that really interesting. In my own life, for me, when you get into areas where you're like, you're just with good people doing good work, and it's just, it's just, it doesn't even feel that hard. And other times I've, in my life, I've been in areas, I'm like, I just don't feel like I'm getting anything done that I really want to get done. And, 
you, there are environments that pull you away from your gifts and there's environments that like distill your gifts. And I'm, I am really interested in that. Um, the, the work that I'm doing right now, you know, in, with a startup company, I'm really loving the whole um, awareness of how people in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley have taken an idea and think of how many ideas you've had in your life. You've probably had hundreds of ideas where you're like, oh, I just have an idea. If they, if somebody made this, I would buy it or I would use it. And then you think maybe I will make it, you know, but um, I mean, the Bay Area is just full of people that had an idea and, mm. and they were excited about their idea and they grew their idea up into um, a business. Um, and the, this idea that they're not just, the, the goal is not to make money. The, the goal is to take this idea and to make something that could either help people or supplement people or do something to the world that feels um, interesting and exciting. So I, I love right now, for me, what's next is I never took the time. I didn't get an MBA. I didn't take the time to really think about um, scaling and taking, you know, innovative uh, people and ideation processes and distilling out, you know, beta products that then you grow up into more refined products. And I've never really done that. I was involved with the, the Cooperative Research Center for Microtechnology that led to Catapult, mm -hmm. but we were small players and um, that took a couple different lurches um, before it became Catapult proper. But for me to answer your question, I'm interested in how um, ideas can turn into um, products and turn into businesses. Um, and I'm particularly interested in that space when it contributes to um, helping people's environments support them being a better parent or being a better teacher or being a better athlete or being a better whatever. Um, I think a lot of us, it's in, innate in us. We want to you want to be a little bit better and sometimes you can't put in more time. So you're looking at how can I be more efficient or how can I sequence things? And I've, I've always really found the, the people part of that super interesting, high performance support teams. Um, I, I think I'll, I'm adjunct right now with Australia Catholic university and I'm, I'm really interested in how do you train up and then put together um, young people with older people in um, support teams where they all feel like they're growing and, and they're getting enriched as well. I think one of the great challenges in, you know, maybe this is for NASA engineers, maybe it's for sports scientists working on their way up to the Olympics. I think that in, there's a lot of really exciting professions where people can lose themselves in pursuit of, of a larger goal. And I wonder how you can build um, environments where the coaches don't feel so prone to burnout and the scientists don't feel so, you know, frustrated and disillusioned and disrespected maybe for their contribution. How do you create something where people are building lifelong friendships and they're looking back on it like you'd look back on high school, like I learned so much at that time. It's not, it's not less than college, it's not more than college. It was just a great time in my life and I learned so much. Um, those themes really, they really interest me. So I'm probably locking down on let's, let's learn about growing up ideas um, and then let's um, do research and let's connect with people who are interested in putting high performance support teams together. I think those, those two areas are kind of what's next for me. And I think I like, I like teaching and I, I, I want to, as I, you know, get a little more time. I, I think I will move back into, you know, like, like the storytelling is fun. And I like the idea of being around other storytellers and, and growing up perspective and, and ideas that help other people that are getting into the industry that we've found so much, you know, excitement and joy in. Wow. Not, not, um, not, um, uh, too shabby a goal that. <laughs> that, <laughs> you gotta have something don't you yeah yeah, yeah. now it, 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 it emerges like I've been really lucky to just keep following my interests and fortunately for me and you know knock on wood and thank my lucky stars um, there's always been something 
exciting and interesting looming and available. And that's a really lucky thing. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see what comes of that. I know you're in that startup space, so there's, there's probably some sensitivities around the, the projects and so on, but um, no, no doubt there'll be some something amazing that emerges from it. Looking for consults, don't you? Don't you worry. The best uh, thing is to be a consultant, isn't it? It's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you don't have to be dad. Dad is responsible for the kids. Uh, the uncle, uncles are not. They come in and have fun and leave. <laughs> that's, that's, that sounds fun when you put it in those terms. Uh, David, I'm so appreciative of your time. Uh, I've always enjoyed your insights and uh, they've always left an indelible mark on, on my career uh, throughout. So, uh, thank you so much. And I loved your your book. Um, I think you're you've been also a, a great voice for combining the perspective of get good solid work done, but don't forget you know the the soft skills and the people side of it as well. I think you've done a great job, you know, voicing and and talking to everyone and making people aware of how important those themes are as well. So no, thanks for having me. Um, it's always fun to catch up with you, and um, I look forward to to following some of your your future podcasts as well. Brilliant, wonderful.